Welcome to the Ultrasound Case of the Month. My name is Greg Zahn, and I am an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine. For anyone new to the series, each case highlights clinical examples where ultrasound help take better care of patients. As always, email me with any questions or concerns at gzahn at iu.edu. This case was seen by the resident, Dr. Austin McDonald, and the attending, Dr. Paul Musay. They were working when a 71-year-old male was transported to the hospital by medic after his wife called 911. She was concerned because the patient was not acting himself and appeared more altered with a decreased level of consciousness. Before this occurred, she did report that he accidentally took an extra dose of his blood pressure medication. From best report, it appeared he double-dosed his beta blocker. Upon arrival, the patient was found to be critically ill. He displayed a heart rate in the 20s with profound hypotension. He was documented to be altered, and the treating team documented GCS of 13. Given his critical illness, multiple interventions were initiated, yet none of these pharmacologic interventions improved his bradycardia and hypotension. Additionally, norepinephrine was initiated and rapidly uptitrated without significant effect. The team went on to attempt transcutaneous pacing, yet were unable to obtain capture. Here is the initial EKG with this profound bradycardia evident. Given this bradycardia resistant to medication, the decision was made to place a transvenous pacer while medications were being optimized and titrated. Ultrasound was utilized to access the right internal jugular vein. A sixth French introducer was placed under ultrasound guidance without difficulty. The pacing apparatus was subsequently passed through into the central venous system. These two clips show representative images of the internal jugular vein, both in short axis and long axis. For the short axis view, we can clearly see that the echogenicity is the tip of the needle since it disappears inside the vessel as the physician slides the probe away from the needle. Placing a transvenous pacer is a skill that we as emergency physicians do infrequently, yet its ability to safely bridge the critical patient to definitive measures is immensely valuable. Like any rare procedure, it helps to have a method that simplifies the process and allows for successful placement. I strongly believe ultrasound can be incredibly useful not only for safely placing central access, yet also for helping ensure placement of the pacing wire into the right ventricle. I am for one much more confident with its ability than hooking up alligator clips and interpreting the tracing. Here is a video clip of a sub xiphoid cardiac view that was obtained near the end of the placement, at the moment when the pacer box was turned on. Identification of the clip as sub xiphoid should be evident given the view of the liver and the four chamber view of the heart. We can clearly see the bright echogenic focus of the pacer wire at the level of the tricuspid valve. It appears as only a small bright area because we are only capturing a small portion of the wire with the ultrasound beam. This clip is quite impressive because we can definitively see that once the pacer is activated, mechanical capture is identified. I really like utilizing sub xiphoid view and helping not only with placement but also to confirm capture because it allows a four chamber view and also easy access to the IVC view, which can be helpful to locate the wire if you don't enter the heart as the catheter is advanced. Here's a subsequent clip where we can see the increased heart rate of the patient. The pacer wire represented by the bright echogenic focus is once again visualized. While the heart rate has increased and capture is present, severe reduction in the left ventricular ejection fraction is noted. With improvement in heart rate, the systolic pressure immediately improved to approximately 110 systolic. This EKG was attained shortly after placement of the transvenous pacer. The EKG shows evidence of a ventricular paced rhythm. A chest x-ray was subsequently obtained showing not only the transcutaneous pacing pads but also the transvenous pacer wire traveling into the right side of the heart. Given the critical illness of patients as is common in the emergency department, multiple interventions occurred shortly upon arrival with less than complete information. As the procedure was being completed, the physicians were handed these labs. They were remarkable for hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury, more aggressive measures targeting the potassium ensued, Yet even with target therapy, the patient still required pacing. Given the patient's critical illness, multiple consultants were called. The patient was admitted to the ICU with cardiology and toxicology consulting. The patient's vials improved dramatically with pacing, and the norepinephrine was able to be weaned. Cardiology started isoproterenol in an attempt to chemically pace the patient. With improvement in the patient's renal function and metabolization of the beta blocker overdose, the patient no longer required pacing the next day. The pacer was removed and isoproterenol was subsequently stopped. He ultimately left the hospital soon after. The first learning point for this case is recognition of what is known as BRASH syndrome. BRASH syndrome stands for bradycardia, renal insufficiency, AV node dysfunction, shock, and hyperkalemia. While not the focus of this case, it's an important concept that I would recommend reviewing if it represents a new concept for you. 
The second learning point was the reason I decided to present the case. Ultrasound is incredibly useful in providing confidence in this high stress procedure. I believe utilization of ultrasound for central access in these situations is a standard of care. When placed in larger French catheter required for pacer placement, ultrasound provides increased safety compared to landmark based approach. As this case displayed, utilizing ultrasound to help with getting the pacer wire in the correct location and to verify mechanical capture is very useful and easy. I personally like the sub xiphoid view because it allows visualization of all four chambers of the heart and the IVC. Obviously, this requires another set of hands, which is usually possible, yet not always available to paint on your practice environment. Basic ultrasound skill with your cardiac examination that you all have can be easily adapted for application for this process. Thanks for watching. Continue using ultrasound to help take better care of your patients. As always, email me with any questions or concerns.